Welcome to the Farm Bits Podcast, a product of Nebraska Extension Digital Agriculture. I'm Jackson Stancil. And I'm Samantha Teton. And we come to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews and panels with experts, producers, and innovators from all sectors of digital technology, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Welcome back to the Farm Bits podcast for the second episode in the Digitizing Farm Management series. Before we get started on today's content, we'd like to remind you that Nebraska Extension and the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network are offering several educational events for Nebraska producers during January and February. If you'd like more information about event opportunities, please reach out to your local Extension educator or check out the website for the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network listed in the podcast description. So in this episode of the Digitizing Farm Management series, we welcome Tyler McGee to the Farm Bits podcast. Tyler is the CEO of Shepherd Farming, a digital farm labor management platform built to improve the ease and efficiency with which farms get work done. Tyler grew up working on his family's farm in Montana and first devised the concept for Shepherd during his graduate studies at Texas A&M University. Since Tyler first completed and tested the Shepherd prototype in 2017, the platform has grown and Tyler was recently recognized in the 2020 cohort of ag grads 30 under 30 for his development work on Shepherd's platform. And as you'll learn in this interview, Tyler is very passionate about what he does and his deep knowledge about farm labor management and agriculture as a whole has informed how Shepherd is designed and deployed. So now that you have some background and have learned a bit about Tyler, let's get to the interview. off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you came to start uh, Shepherd Farming. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Tyler McGee. I'm the founder and CEO of Shepherd Farming. Um, I got my background growing up working on a family farm in northeast Montana, uh, two miles south of the Canadian border. So, you know, it's <laughs> as rural and remote as it gets for some folks. Um, for me, it was very interesting because that was my first, you know, diving right down into agriculture, but it was also especially as I was in high school and, and getting ready to leave for college, it gave it an awful lot of opportunity to think. And one of the things that I would do is I would look around just the, the nature of me and see, you know, how do things work and how can they be better? I always joke that I can take just apart, just about anything apart with the Phillips head screwdriver and put it back together. <laughs> but a better question is then, you know, how can things be better? How can they be improved? And what I saw on our farm was it, you know, it was run and managed by my grandfather and everything went through him. And that meant a lot of our day was spent going back and forth to him. What needs to be done next? Where are things at? What are we working on? And when you're a kid, you don't notice that so much. But as you grow up, you realize there's an awful lot of time that's being eaten up doing this. So went to college, you know, did undergrad at University of Montana. And I was jokingly tell, I still have professors I talked to that I terrorized my professors for four years with questions <laughs> about agriculture. I had a professor sit me down junior year and she's like, would you go do something with Apple or Amazon? <laughs> Let's stop this. But I kept on and this was, you know, 2008 was when we really started getting kicked off. So iPhone and apps and mobile was really starting to come into its own. And I had a good friend of mine where he and I looked at it and said, there is so much potential here, but especially at ag, and here's this whole side that just isn't being looked at the way that it deserves. And so after writing my research thesis for undergrad, got picked up by Texas A&M. They took me down there for, for grad school, and I got my graduate degree at Texas A&M in agriculture, economics, and business. And um, about midway through that, Syngenta got word of what I was working on, and they told me I was moving out here to North Carolina. <laughs> so um had a, my, my mentor at Texas A&M, he said, I'm really disappointed that they're snatching you away from me. But at the same point, that's kind of what I did back when you were an undergrad. So I can't fault them too much. Uh, <laughs> I did six and a half years at Syngenta, working their research and development technology group over here in the research triangle. And about two years ago, I was sitting down with my managers and I said, you know, there's this concept that we were working on way back in undergrad. And at the time it was all hypothetical, but I think there's something to it. I think there's something here. And they gave me this best, most possible answer that I could possibly get. And it was, uh, whatever you do nights and weekends is your deal. So that was when I taught myself how to code. It was very, very rough, but I did. I wrote the very first version of, of the Shepherd app. 
and test it out with some family farmer friends up in Montana. And that's where we said, yeah, this, this has legs to it. There's value here. You know, we're solving mm-hmm. a real problem. And after that, we got accepted into Ag Launch based out of Memphis and started working with farmers on research trials at scale. And that was where we really, you know, got things kicked off, you know, really put gas on it. That's a really, really, really cool story. It's mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. I can tell you've told it before. It's, uh, <laughs> well, it I always really like good. to tell people there is not a single line of my code running on Shepard anymore. We found you know, <laughs> coders that are much better than myself. Mine was a prototype. But That's one of incredible. the very first person we had working on the code, still, you know, very good friend of mine. And he once was looking through the code base and he said, you know, who wrote this? And I told him, me, Beam. <laughs> he said, this is the least efficient script I'd ever seen in my life. And that takes some doing. And he, he said, you know, why did you write it this way? And I said, because that's the only way I knew how. And I said, it worked. And he said, barely, but it did. And it was, when we say a POC, proving the concept, it proved the concept and not much more. <laughs> That's, I guess, it, you know, it got you to where you are today. And I guess that's the important part, right? Got you kicked off. That's so. exactly it is. We needed something to test it, you know, very, very simple. And the managers at Syngenta, when they saw what I was working on, one of them pointed out that for the total cost of what it took us to get things up and running was the catering budget of a project inside, you know, a large corporation, which just blew my mind. I thought that was the most amazing thing. Absolutely. <laughs> So I guess, you know, for some of our, our listeners, I'm sure some of our listeners are very aware of like what the issues are with farm labor management. Um, you know, S- Sam and I are not necessarily farm labor management experts by any stretch of the imagination. So before we kind of dive in a little bit more to what exactly Shepard does and, and what challenges it's trying to address, uh, could you just give us kind of a brief overview of what the biggest challenges are on, on the modern farm and, and kind of what some of the trends are out there right now? Yeah, for sure. So there's a couple of them. That's a great question. So the first one is just not enough people, not enough people to do the work. This is where you read stories about produce rotting in the field or, you know, that they just cannot find people no matter what they're willing to pay. And that's a problem. That's a problem we see in a lot of rural economies, a lot of, of areas. Um, the second problem is that you have, you're able to find people, but you're not able to keep them informed about what they need to be working on. This is an efficiency problem. And especially when I was back at Syngenta, I picked up on this a lot because I'd work with a lot of farms and I'd see, you know, I'd always go into the farm management office when we were testing things out. And um, I would see farms where they had walls covered in sticky notes. That was always (laughs) a personal favorite of mine. I saw one farm would print out paperwork orders and stick them on the seats of tractors and equipment. And then people would do, I called it Oklahoma land rush, but you know, like (laughs) trying to find the piece of equipment that they wanted. And all of this sounds really funny, but the problem is it's eating into your time each day. Oh, yeah. You're sitting down and having a 60 or 90 minute meeting each morning. That's an hour and a half that you could be out working and getting stuff done. And so really what it boils down to is you either have, you know, that you can't find enough people or the right people or people with the right skill sets or that the people you have, it's not that it's any fault of them, but it's just that there's not this efficiency that's being gained. You know, I, I tell people that, especially in egg, we see the equipment is practically self-driving now, right? We've got seeds that are bio and genetic engineered. We've got chemicals that are tailor-made to specific pests. Mm -hmm. And then we have labor, which really hasn't changed much in five decades. And that's one where we we say, yeah, it's not that technology can't make this work better. It's just that we haven't done it yet. And that's what we're at with Shepard of applying technology to solve this problem and make it work just as well as the rest of the farm. Yeah, that's awesome. Really cool. And you've been all over the United States. You've worked in many different states. So can you tell us a little bit about how like these labor management challenges are different in different parts, whether it's a small farm or a large farm, specialty farms and things like that? Yep. So a really good example. And one that I love pointing out is with Ag Launch, we did trials on quite a few farms, but we did trials on one farm. There was a 20,000 acre farm spread across <laughs> three different states. They grow cotton and they grow soy. I mean, these people run their operation like a business and that's pretty common. You know, they They have spreadsheets, they have data, they, you know, everything is done with phones and text messages and calls and meetings, but like this, this place runs like a business. It's a very impressive operation. And another trial we did was with a produce operation in middle, mid Tennessee, where they have less than an acre in size, but everything they do is under hoop houses. So they're, you know, constantly churning out the most beautiful produce you'd ever see. It's gorgeous, the colors. And it's, it's all very manual intensive, right? Because you've got to be planting it, you've got to be weeding it, you've got to be picking it and packing it. And that was what we really wanted to find out was, does something like Shepherd, if we make it flexible enough, meet the needs of a farm that's 20,000 acres of cotton and soy, 
but also work at a scale where if you have produce operations that are in a greenhouse environment, they're getting benefit out of it too, that it's the same type of improvement for them. And what we found is, yes, it does. And that's what I love about ag is that there's such a variety and everyone's got a, a different way of doing things. And it's, it's like one big experiment to see how can we make things better? How can we improve? And at the end of the season, it all comes down to the, the yield. That's how we measure success. And that's what I love is, you know, always testing new things out and finding ways to get just a little bit more. Yeah. So it sounds like that ag launch program was a really good opportunity to, to get this kind of out on real farms and see a lot of different scenarios. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about exactly how you set up those trials and how that collaborative process with those growers worked to kind of influence how you've designed Shepherd? Yep, absolutely. So that actually comes back to what I was working on in my professional career, which has always been on the research side. So when it came to setting up trials, this is something that I'm quite familiar with. <laughs> um, what we did is we would sit down with the growers, we'd fill them in on what we're working on, put it in their hands, say, this is how it works. Are you interested? And that was the ag launch process really goes into to a lot of depth with their farmer network on that of, you know, what are you interested in? What do you want to be running trials on? And then when we had a team of farmers who said, yep, raised their hands and said, we're all in on this, we want to try this out. We'd start out by, you know, in the beginning of the season, understanding what are your challenges? How do you work? What's your setup like? Um, then we get them trained, you know, put it in their hand, get it installed on their devices, run through some training with their workers and then do check-ins, especially in 2019, 2020 <laughs> is obviously a little bit more challenging because travel sure. was, was quite complicated. But in 2019, especially, we were out in the field every two weeks, meeting with farmers, um, following up, how are things going? Where are you getting stuck? And one farmer in particular, Scott Fullen, said, you know, we would push out a new version every two weeks based on the feedback from them. And that's something wow. we can do with software is, you know, if it's something that needs to get fixed, we fix it. In some cases, I would actually put my developers on speakerphone in their office and say, you know, guys, would you describe the problem you're seeing? And the developers would fix it. And some problems were really big. When we started out the season, you would assign a crop to a field and that was it. You had no option to do, you know, multiple crops or double cropping or, you know, even changing the crop at the end of the season. So we had to get that fixed. That was uh, priority one. But another problem we ran into was, you know, somebody raised their hand and said, it'd be really cool if I had a decimal point on this keypad and I could put in, you know, 10th of an acre, or hundredth of an acre when I'm building a field. And they said, you know, how hard is that going to be and I said it's going to take me about 15 minutes and you're going to watch and I called the developer up I said you know switch the keyboard type to the one with the decimal key on it and we push that out so all through our research trials it's constant iteration and it's based on feedback so we're always talking to farmers of uh, you know what do you like what is problematic what are you confused about what should be really obvious and isn't um, we've even gone to the point of, of recording farmers getting their account set up so we can go back through frame by frame and see you know, is this as clear as it needs to be, or do we need to be more clear about the instructions for how to get something set up? Uh, we typically tell people it takes about 30 minutes to an hour to get, you know, everybody up and running and going. And that's been the, the benefit of doing a lot of testing, a lot of trials to get that. Yeah. I, I, one thing I just want to follow up on, you kind of brought up this, this whole thing of, you know, being able to change crops later in the year and having this whole year to year, you know, difference between crops. I'm back home in Alabama right now and driving around, you know, my house, there are still cotton fields here that are, that are not harvested right now. Yep. And they're going to get harvested obviously in 2021, but they were planted in 2020. How challenging is that on the software side to, to deal with? Is that kind of a structural thing on the, on the software side that has to be dealt with, or is it something you can fix, you know, kind of once you get, get down development a little ways. So it's always something that we can fix. This is one thing that I love about software is that, you know, no matter what it is, we can go in, we can check for bugs and we can fix it on the fly. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, way back in Syngenta, we had a project where it was a, a physical sensor in the field and it got struck by lightning, one of our test units. <laughs> and they came to me with this smoldering thing and they said, uh, you know, what could we have done about that? And I, I was an architect at the time. So I just did a shrug and I said, act of gods are a little acts of God are a little bit out of my, <laughs> my jurisdiction here. Um, but with software, we can go through. And one of the things that we do is we, we have tracking on the, the app for bugs. You know, anytime there's a crash, anytime there's a problem, whether or not the farmer reports it, we get a log back that says, Hey, this was a problem. It was a crash. It was unexpected. And here's what, what triggered it. And I always tell farmers, you know, any information you can provide, whether it's feedback or a crash that happened, always provide it back. 
but know that we're also keeping really close watch. So if you don't know how to describe, you know, what, what happened, or if you're not a very technical person, that's okay too, because we're doing a lot of watching and we're looking out for the, the types of problems and solving them proactively. Awesome. That is awesome. Just a question, just from a startup perspective, like, mm -hmm. do you think that these challenges and troubleshooting, is that like really rapid in the beginning and like slows down, or is that something you have to strive for, you know, year after year to continue to make these changes? Ideally, it's something that should never go away. It's something that you build into your team. Um, we have a really, really good team of people who it's all about iterative development, where we say, you know, this is our milestone. This is what we're working on building. And these are the iterations it's going to take to get there. And then we just turn release after release after release out internally until we really like it. And then we release it out to the general public. So I always have a version that's a couple of versions ahead of what the general public has running on my phone. Mm -hmm. And even if it's something just like watering a garden in the backyard, I, I use Shepherd on that too, <laughs> just to constantly be testing it. And there have been times where I was like, huh, that doesn't look quite right. And I'll take a <laughs> screenshot and send it back to the team. And they're like, man, it is 11 o'clock at night. And I'll have to deal with it tomorrow. But I found this weird looking thing. So constant iterative development. Absolutely. That's awesome. awesome. So we've talked a lot about development. And I think there's one more thing that I want to get to before we get to what exactly, you know, shepherd farming does for people. Yeah. And, and that is, what is kind of the biggest challenge that you've faced when getting this, this platform out there? You know, I think we've talked about a few of the different challenges you've had, but one, one question that comes to mind for me is real connectivity. That's a really big issue out there. I'm wondering how a wireless platform like this, that, that relies on, I assume an internet connection yeah. is able to deal with this connectivity issue. Yeah, so rural connectivity is, is an excellent issue because it's one that we know is getting better, but slowly. And so what we do with that is we, you know, we always have this, this optimistic view of the future that eventually this problem will go away, whether it's satellites or 5G or something, this will get better, but it's going to be an iterative process. So what we do in the meantime is what we call aggressive caching, where the way the platform is written, the way that it runs right now is if you have an internet connection, you're rock solid. Every change you make, every task you send out or everything you complete is going to be live. It's going to go back to whoever sent it to you or the master record instantly. It's going to be fine. When you have bad or poor connectivity, what happens is the platform is always checking, you know, if your number of bars drops below a certain point. And if it becomes a problem, it'll start just saving everything locally. It doesn't tell you this. It doesn't say, you know, <laughs> pop up some warning that, hey, things are getting kind of rough over here. It just quietly handles it itself. And as soon as you get good connectivity again, it pushes all those changes at once. Nice. If you get on the plane, you can keep making tasks. You can keep marking things as done. When you land and turn your antenna back on on your phone, all of those things are going to get pushed up and it'll handle it just like normal. So for the end user perspective, they don't notice any difference. We handle that on our side and make sure that it's completely smooth. Great. That is good to hear. Yep. Yeah, that, that's one where rural connectivity is such an important issue and especially, you know, making sure people in, in government are aware of it, that, that that is a blocker for agriculture. And it's not just us, it's everybody. And like I said, it's getting better, but it's got a ways to go for sure. Yeah, that's something that we're we're actually planning to get into with our next series here on the Farm Bits podcast because it's something we run into with trying to get data shared between you know our people who are out in the field and people who are back on campus and I'm sure you know everybody else who's got any internet problems at all. It's something they deal with. So, and that's one of the nice parts about how our platform works is because it's running on your phone. At some point in the day, you're going to be back through town or you're going to be driving along a place that has good coverage. It's not the same with a sensor that's in a static position. And if it doesn't have good coverage, it just doesn't have good coverage. <laughs> right. And so we bank on that where, you know, people actually have quite a bit of, of time each day where they have good coverage. So regardless, it'll work just fine for them. That is true. That's good. That's a, that's a good way to think about it, I think. Mm -hmm. So now someone is not familiar with Shepard. And if we can go into the features a little bit, can you tell us um, how is Shepard Farming addressing the labor management issues? So yeah. all these things we've talked about. So the way Shepherd works, Shepherd is a labor management platform. And what that means is it's, it's giving tools to the farm management side to be able to tell their workers tasks, you know, we send them work orders. This is what you need to be working on. It gives workers a way to know what they need to be doing and what they're responsible for and all the information in one spot. We call them task cards. And for the farm as a whole, it makes it really clear where they are through the season. It catches anything that's getting behind. It makes it really apparent. Um, one of our farms, the, the 20,000 acre farm actually was the one that brought it up. He said, 
his measure of success is if he could feel like he was standing in the middle of that field that was in a different state and know exactly where they were at without having to make phone calls, you know, two or three times a day to where are you at? What are you working on? Where are things getting stuck? So that's what we built with Shepherd is a labor management platform geared at agriculture. When we started, that was the, the primary objective. And then we started realizing that there were a whole lot of really cool things we could do with this now that we've got this rock solid foundation. In. And one of my favorite ones is what we call weather intelligence, where if, and this is on Shepherd right now, this is completely active. If you create a task and send it to somebody in the next, I think it's 14 days. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna send a, Jackson a, a task next Tuesday to go out and plant soybeans in a field. It might be a little bit cold, but I think it'll work. <laughs> if I send that task to him, I've already included a location, I've included a time frame, and I've included activity types. The system automatically checks the weather at that time, that location, and figures out, is it going to be a good time to do that, or is it going to be a problem? If it doesn't look like there's going to be any issues, it'll pass it right on to Jackson. Things will be great. If it looks like the weather is going to be problematic, it'll actually kick it back to me and with a list of suggested dates that are plus or minus, I think, two in either direction. So it's proactively catching things and saying, hey, this looks like it's going to be a problem. If you didn't know there was a 60% chance of rain in that field next week, I'm going to let you know. And I'm going to say Wednesday is going to be a lot better or Monday. Mm -hmm. And that actually came from direct feedback from a farmer where he called me up and I could tell he was in a foul mood. <laughs> I just drove two counties over, spent hours on the road today to get there and found out that the rainstorm had just finished up. Mm -hmm. And so it's that level of understanding how farms work and solving problems but in a proactive way and a way that's out of the way so that it feels like magic where, you know, the platform is keeping track of things. It's, it's meant to be that, that magic farm manager that's just kind of keeping tabs. How are things going? And if something's getting behind, flag it and bring it to people's attention before it gets slipped. So uh, thinking about the weather, is there any way that you can add like a soil temperature or if like you had a probe in the ground, can that go to the app? Because I just think about planting conditions or yeah. hydrus and things like that. Not yet. Okay. These are things that we're working on. In fact, our lead data engineer is working on building out a really cool API set. And one of the things that it's going to be enabling is things like that. So one of the other questions that we've got that I'm really excited about is, you know, for spraying type tasks, could you be managing drift? You know, instead of just thinking about precipitation, can we be thinking about wind speed, wind direction, things like this? We're absolutely, and we want that same level of intelligence where if you were standing in that field, would you give a thumbs up or a thumbs down for that work? And then, you know, bringing that to people's attention before they have to go out and physically do it. That's yeah, awesome. You, you kind of got to a question that I think we were, we were going to try to get to is about those APIs. Cause I, I think with a system like this, that's a really big opportunity. You know, I'm thinking about with weather stations, like I think Davis has APIs out there and I'm sure that, you know, y'all are, you know, using those weather APIs. Have you, have you looked at all at, at uh, the machinery side? I know a lot of uh, machinery manufacturers are putting out their online, you know, cloud uh, platforms. Are you looking at APIs with those as well? We are. And that's something that we, from the get-go said, you know, especially as machinery becomes more and more automated, we know that I don't see a day in probably any of our lifetimes where farms are entirely automated. There will always be a human presence to some degree or another, but you're going to have more automation. And so what we've built into the design and the data model from the get-go was the ability to interact with those machinery APIs. And if you have a piece of equipment that's getting more and more autonomous, that if you send a task to that, it should be able to react to that and it should be able to complete that. So we've always said, you know, Shepard for something that's so driven on being able to send stuff to the workers, doesn't actually care if there's a worker there or not. What it cares is that the work got done. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's really important. I, I think, cause you know, you're seeing companies like Sabanto and, and dot and everything that are coming along with all this. And, um, I think that, you know, like you said, automation is coming and I like the flexibility of the platform in terms of being able to, to do both workers and, and automation at the same time. Yep. And that's still a ways out. I don't want anyone getting, you know, <laughs> terrified that the, the driverless ta tractor horde is coming. <laughs> it's in the future and it's something that you need to be thinking about. You know, that's something that as we're designing things, we keep in our mind is knowing that the landscape and agriculture is always shifting and you've got to be thinking ahead about that. So building on this, like working with other APIs or other companies, mm -hmm. um, how much like setup is involved for setting up fields or setting up parameters, operation parameters? And is some of that coming from things like Deer Operation Center or Climate Field View? Is there any interaction there? So right now it's strictly on Shepherd. You go in okay. and map out your field just like any others. It's one of the things that we're looking into is being able to pull in data from folks like Climate and 
uh, field view and um, John Deere. That's definitely critical because people don't like having to remap field <laughs> view, obviously. Yep. Um, but the other exciting thing about is not only being able to pull data in, but also with APIs being able to push data out. And one mm -hmm. of the things that we've been talking with people is, you know, folks like Granular, where we operate sort of as a farm management system. It's, it's geared more at the worker and the labor side and, and the actual farm management and less about the financial and the bookkeeping aspect. But if you have something like Granular in place, we don't see ourselves as trying to replace that at all. And the state that we want to get to is instead being able to send that data across and say, if you want to use someone like Granular for financial and, and bookkeeping, that's fine. And if you want to use Shepard for the, the actual day-to-day -day management and operations, that's fine too. It comes down to the APIs being put in place and making sure those bridges are in the right places at the right time. And that, so that, that, that kind of brings me to another question I've had, you know, in our conversations with growers, we we've, we've heard a few times that they want to be able to have kind of the note taking aspect uh, that, you know, has the, has all of the manual data capture with it alongside some of this uh, digital data that we have that's coming out of yield monitors or it's as applied. Yep. Is, do you think there's any opportunity to kind of bridge anything that's captured within Shepard with that as applied data or, or the yield data? There is. So we already capture some of that as applied data. Uh, that's part of a task. And it's more on, you know, telling the, the people, for example, if you were fertilizing, I want this fertilizer content applied to this piece of land. So that it's more as applied, but anticipatory rather than recording side. Mm -hmm. I always tell the story of, you know, on my family farm, everything was stored in my grandfather's head. And it was kind of remarkable at times that he could tell you, you know, there's 37 cows out in that West pasture and somebody go out there on a four wheeler and check and make sure they're all there. Um, nobody could figure out how he did it. But when he passed away, all of that information went away. And that was actually a challenge in my family was then we had to go and find all this information out. And I tell farmers that, you know, when we look at what we're trying to do, who our biggest competition is, what we're trying to replace, it's a yellow legal pad. And my son <laughs> trying to move farmers into that digital world, but make it easy and make it really efficient and, and better for them than trying to keep it all down on a scratch pad somewhere because that data is vital. That is how you run your operation. But especially if you're more than just a one-man operation, you have to have a way to be able to share that with your team. And that's what Shepherd is all about. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you guys really have, you know, that recording and providing all that data for the farmer, that part's down. Is there any moves to the next step of like providing recommendations? So saying like, oh, this is really inefficient. Maybe you should think about trying this or, oh, today would be a really good day to go spray. Is there anything like that? Or is it mainly just providing the data? There's a lot like that. There, <laughs> there are a lot of things that we're working on. We've got a whole wall covered with ideas <laughs> of, of what we call proactive and predictive, where <laughs> it's it's taking things like the weather intelligence that I was talking about to the next level. It's, it's trying to be less of the magic notepad that always is keeping track of what you're doing and more of a magic assistant that's thinking a couple steps ahead about what you that is on the road. We got all really exciting things that we're working on and it's, it's very cool seeing them come together. I always tell people of when we were working on this in college, you know, one of the challenges that we ran into at one point was there wasn't enough computing power in the world to run some of the simulations that we wanted to do. You know, if you mm. said, I want to take satellite imagery and, you know, find the acreage of all of the acreage in North America. I mean, good luck. That was, yeah. yeah, look at, you know, Captain Marvel over there. But now with things like cloud computing and with these, these scalable resources that we have, not only is it something that's doable, but it's something that we're doing. And I always tell the team and I tell farmers that we're working with, I'm just as excited about the things that we're building as the people <laughs> using Shepard that, you know, in some ways I get more excited when we release something sure. and it's like, guys, We've got this awesome new feature and it's taken a lot of time and effort to get here, but it works and it's so, and that's, that's one of my favorite parts of the job is sharing those new features as they come out with the farmers. Yeah, it's, I mean, if, I can tell that you're very passionate about what you're doing. And I think that's a huge selling point. I think anybody who listened to you talk about this would know that, you know, you're fully gung ho and, and committed to making it happen. So I, I guess one thing on this recommendations piece that, that, I guess I'm grappling with on my side because you know, on a decision support software is my thesis project out here at Nebraska mm -hmm. right now. And I think one thing that I've learned from conversations with growers is they want to be able to have control of that software because at the end of the day, they are the people who have expertise on that particular field. Right. Yeah. But there's also expertise on the software people's side that have, you know, a lot of data and, and good recommendations to make. So how are you striking that balance between your recommendations and what the farmer at the end of the day wants to decide to do? 
So when we design these features and these capabilities, we always design it with the mindset of, of a nudge of, hey, I found this thing. It might be something important for you to take a look at, but you, the farmer, are the one making that decision. And that's something that, especially you know, back in my, my career with Syngenta and on the research side was, there's a, a disconnect between people sometimes who have spent all of their time in the labs or in academia or in software development where they don't understand the amount of knowledge and experience that farmers have. And if you go at this trying to say, farmer, you don't know what you're doing and I'm here to tell you how to do your job better, you're gonna fail every time. That instead what you need to be doing is saying, here's this piece of information that I've, I've found and that I've, I've turned into something that is actionable, but I need you to take a look at it and decide if this is what you want to do with your land, with your equipment, you know, this is ultimately your decision. And that is something that really comes from having a, par a farming background and an understanding of it is what you're doing is you're making a recommendation. You're not making a demand. And if you approach it that way, you're going to be a lot more successful because there's nothing worse I've found than something that is way too pushy with its demands. <laughs> and that, that almost becomes comical at times, but where something that thinks it knows everything and in fact knows very little, that, that becomes very frustrating to work around. So is that something I'm, I'm sure that you have some people who are not from an agriculture background on your team? Is that something that you have really worked hard to try to instill in your team? Is it something that's been challenging to to kind of get people to to see? I'm just I'm curious. It's it's a really good question. Most of the people on our team actually come from an agriculture background. Okay. Some of them are reaching a little farther back than others, but that's sure. something that we try very hard to find is if you're coming to the team, we need you to be very, very talented at what you're doing. You know, if you're programming or developing or what have you, you need to be very good at that. But you also need to come at it with a mindset of, of how this works, because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for you to understand why things are the way they are sometimes. And for the couple of people who don't really have that agriculture background, what we do is we do field trips. We, you know, we have them talk to farmers. We have them work in the field. And I believe that every single person should spend at least some time getting their boots sturdy in the field because there's no better way to understand why things are the way they are, especially when you're trying to design software and tools. And I remember I had just gotten started at, uh, you know, in my corporate career and we decided to have a field day where we were going to go out and talk to this farmer. And my manager had been with the company for 30 plus years. And I'll never forget the look on his face where he was out there with me, a farmer and another coworker of mine, because she came from Nebraska. Um, <laughs> so three of us, quite a lot of farming background, but he, he saw a center pivot irrigator and his face lit up and he just looked at the farmer like a little kid. And he said, that thing, I want to drive that thing. He thought it was <laughs> like something out of Star Wars. And the farmer just started laughing and he said, I mean, you can go ride it, but it's not going anywhere very quickly. But that's what we have more of is when you have people who don't have this understanding of why things work the way they work in agriculture, don't shun them or, or turn your nose at them or, or off them, bring them out in the field and show them, have them spend a day out in the sun, you know, working and understanding that things are done for a reason. And you have to understand that rather than try to constantly fight against it. Perfect. That's awesome advice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what do you envision being the long-term goal of shepherd farming? We've got, <laughs> I was joking with my, my partner that we've got about three lifetimes worth of ideas. So <laughs> a lot of that comes down to prioritization. I always tell the, the investors that there's no shortage of workers. And one time my parents asked me, you know, when is this all done? And I just, <laughs> I was like, never, it's never done. Constant improvement, constant new features and, and cool ideas to test out. But what we see as the future of Shepherd is, so we say right now that our, our objective, our goal, our mission is to keep, you know, make sure nothing stops work from getting done on the farm. And that I think is central to everything that we will continue doing is, you know, whether that's from a labor side, from the workers, the teams, all the way to, you know, making sure that things don't run out, making sure that you're always thinking ahead to the next season anything that we can be doing to make it never feel like there's a roadblock in the way of getting work done on the farm. That's the key. And I don't think that's going anywhere. That's amazing. And, and I think it's, it just seems like it's a relentless pursuit of, of exactly, you know, accomplishing what that, that goal is, um, which I really like to, I like to hear. And I guess, you know, listen to you say that I'm wondering where does the shepherd name come from? Like, is it, does it have some tie to all of these ideas that you're talking about? Or is it, you know, just like the, the picture in the left-hand corner of your screen there, is it just a, a dog that everybody loved? It's such a good, it's such a good question. 
my partner and I have a German Shepherd, an all black German Shepherd. That's the name. I wish there was some <laughs> grand story or that it spelled something out or something. We have an all black German Shepherd named Sterling. And we also have a Siberian Husky. And that's the dichotomy of the Husky is always looking for a way to get out of work. It's always looking for one more you know, stunt or trick to pull. And the German <laughs> Shepherd is always planning ahead. It's always thinking, but it's always staying out of your way. And the best example I can give is when we go on, on walks or hikes with the two dogs, the Husky is held on a four, five foot long chain leash. You know, he's not going anywhere because he would get lost and have no way of finding his way back if he ever did find freedom. But <laughs> German Shepherd spends a lot of his time off leash. He's always about 30 feet ahead and he'll walk at pace with us, but every so often stop and look back, make sure that we're okay and then carry on. And that's what we wanted to design with Shepherd was something that is always thinking ahead, is always proactive, is making sure that things are getting done, but stays out of the way. Hmm. Uh, it, it, it's an embodiment. I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's so well named, but I don't think you'd ever know that unless you heard the story. We, ha we have him on the website as our uh, quality assurance officer. <laughs> when people see the picture of the, the Black German Shepherd on social media, that's Sterling. Perfect. That's, awesome. that's good to know. So if someone is as captivated of this as we have been listening to you, where would you recommend that they go to learn more about shepherd farming? And is there a specific farmer out there that you think really benefits from this technology that you would encourage to go check this out right now? Absolutely. So we keep things pretty simple. If you want more information, go to shepherdfarming.com. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Shepherd Farming. Um, the types of farmers that we're really working best with right now is larger row crop operations that, you know, where labor optimization and efficiency is key, where it's at the end of the day, got to get stuff done, got to keep the team working, especially if the team is spread out over any distance, keeping the team together and making it feel like you're all in the same room, even when you can't be, and making sure that things are getting done in a timely fashion, that they're getting done right. We're working right now on adding produce module and an animal ag module. So that's going to be coming mm -hmm. shortly. Wow. And one thing that we've talked with quite a bit with farmers is I come from a family farm. Right now, the platform really, really sings on larger farms, but we're working on building out business and, and product models that work really well for family farms too. So fear not, we're coming back for you. <laughs> Nobody's been forgotten. Um, but so, so we've designed it with a, a business model that's designed to be very fair and very simple. And what we've done is we've said, it's not a per acre pricing model. It's not a per user model. It's one flat fee, one license per farm. And we've done that to make it a no brainer for farms that wanna be using Shepherd. Um, it makes farms work more efficiently, faster, better, and get more done out of every day. And that's what we've designed it to be. And the, the pricing works that way too. Awesome. So if you have one piece of advice besides, you know, go pick up Shepherd and try it for yourself <laughs> for those farmers who might be listening out there, what is that piece of advice that maybe is farm, farm labor management focused that you'd like to provide to those listeners? I would say so. In addition, yeah, go try it out. We have a 30 day free trial, so you can try it out and not even have to worry about if you're going to like it or not. You've got a whole month to test it out with your team. The piece of advice I would give is don't take things as they are. You know, we, we talked about how the machinery, the seeds, the chemical are always getting better. And what has always struck me as odd is that with labor, people just accept that it doesn't work very well and that it just kind of is what it is in terms of being difficult and expensive and, and cumbersome. It doesn't have to be that way. What it takes is people saying, this can be better and it needs to be better and we have ways of making it better. And that's what we've done with Shepherd and all through agriculture. There are other examples out there too, I'm sure, of if something seems difficult or cumbersome, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. What it needs is for somebody to take a critical eye to it and say, how does this need to be better? What is causing this to be as difficult as it is? Yeah. So if someone has that idea of something that should be improved, what's your advice for somebody who's looking to start up a business or start up an idea? I, that's an excellent question. I would say the model we've used has worked out very well for us and we stumbled into it. There was no pre-planning. It was, if you see something that you think could be better, try to fix it yourself, you know, put a little effort into it, but not a ton of money. Just see if you can, you know, make something together out of rubber bands and paper clips that goes a, a ways to solving the problem that proves that there's something there. And if there is, then reach out. There are a lot of these ag and ag tech accelerator programs out there. Ag Launch is one, Plug and Play is another one that we've been involved with that are really good about saying, all right, you have an idea here, you have a concept and there's some merit to it. 
let's take that the next step forward. Let's build it out, put a little scale behind it, and then put it in the hands of some users and get feedback on it. And people ask, you know, how did we get started with an accelerator? It was literally from listening to another ag tech podcast, much like your own, where another startup was talking and I was you know, on my commute into work. And I remember having the thought of this guy seems one, to know what he's talking about and to have a good head on his shoulders. And two, to be a couple steps ahead of where we are. And I reached out to him, I believe it was on LinkedIn and asked him, how did you get where you are? And so I guess that would be the other piece of advice that I'd give is talk to people, talk to people that are a couple steps ahead of you and see how they got there and use that as a reference for how you want to move forward. And it doesn't mean you have to follow them exactly, but it gives you a pattern to work off of. I think that's great advice. And I hope mm-hmm. that we have somebody out there listening who's, who's going to pick it up and, and run with it. Um, Cause I think it's great. I don't know. I'm thinking about taking it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, go get your, your thesis done first. <laughs> exactly. I want to say, I also imagine having the communication skills and the passion that you have helps as well to be able to explain your ideas and get people excited. I would say it's definitely helpful too. That's another (laughs) great thing to bring up is something that I learned a long time ago is any kind of public speaking, anything you can do like that. I know everyone hates it. I hate it myself, (laughs) but the more you do it, the better you get at it and the less it, it gets to you. And that's something that you just have to practice through. Nobody is born a good communicator you have to just work on it. And so for people out there that think, you know, I've got this great idea, I just wish I was better at communicating it. The prob- the challenge is getting the idea and being able to solve it. The challenge is not communicating. That's just something that comes with practice and with doing it. Thank you to Tyler McGee for joining us today on the Farm Bits podcast. Neither Jackson nor I are experts on farm labor issues and management. And I think it's safe to say we learned quite a bit from farm labor management today and how digital technologies are helping to solve some chronic challenges in this area. Yeah, Shepard is doing some really, really cool things. And I think my favorite part of this interview was Tyler's discussion of exactly how Shepard was developed through collaboration with real farmers on real farms uh, doing real work. You know, many of their features were designed based on requests from the farmers that they were working with, uh, with like the Ag Launch Accelerator, for example. And Tyler emphasized that being in the field and meeting with farmers throughout the development process was critical to how they've developed the platform. And so I think the deep knowledge uh, that they've developed through that process will prove to be really valuable uh, for Shepard moving forward in the long term. I completely agree. Even when we talked about like making recommendations for farmers, they never claim to know more than the farmer. And I think that's such an important thing uh, to make a company successful. Uh, My other favorite part is his advice on not just being satisfied with the status quo of how things are going. So, Mm -hmm. you know, labor is a huge challenge. And I think a lot of people just accept that it's a problem and don't really think that there's a, an easy solution, but, you know, Tyler showed that he thought of something and used digital technology to try to improve it and come up with creative problem solving. Yeah. He's a great example of somebody who's, is just kind of striving for a goal and and doesn't want to let anything get in the way as long as there are tools there to get it done. Um, Mm -hmm. So with that said, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Farm Bits podcast, and we look forward to you joining us next week as we continue on in the digitizing farm management series. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Bits podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review section of your favorite podcast platform. Our contact information can also be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Bits.